study of the life of Elijah and Elisha to 2 Kings chapter 2 and that chapter covers the end of one era and the beginning of another. It is of course the transition story from the ministry of Elijah to the ministry of Elisha, of Elijah's ascension into heaven and of Elisha's accession to succeed him as the Lord's prophet and as the Lord's anointed servant in Israel. Now what I want to do this morning is just to follow with you the significance of this account of the end of the old prophet's life and ministry and the emergence of the man Elisha as God's man for this new day. We have already thought a few Sundays ago about Elisha's call to serve God, but this is his beginning in the ministry to which he came succeeding Elijah. Like the rest of his life, the way Elijah left this world was remarkable and dramatic. He did not die as other men die. Rather, he was swept into heaven in a whirlwind, Not, I think, in a chariot, but in a whirlwind, if you notice in chapter 2, verse 1, for example, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, the chariot accompanied Elijah, but I rather think that being a chariot of fire, he was scarcely inside it. But he was taken to heaven in a whirlwind, and God sent a chariot of horses and fire to mark the occasion And in verse 11 we read, as they went on and talked, behold, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. I think that the point of Elijah's remarkable death is not just as a climax to a remarkable life. It seems rather to be a public token from God of something which is of enormous importance. And that is, that the ultimate power in a sinful, evil, rebellious world belongs to God and not to the kingdom of evil against which Elijah had stood. And here, in a sense, God is giving notice as he overwhelms death, as it were, and all the kingdom to which death belongs. He is giving notice to the powers of darkness which death symbolized of his final victory over them. Of course, this is one of these Old Testament shadows of something which blossoms into full reality in the New Testament revelation that the Lord Jesus had drawn death's sting, invaded its domain and disarmed the principalities and powers publicly triumphing over them. Now I think it's full of significance that the next time Elijah appeared on earth, when he came, as it were, in the opposite direction from that glory into which he was swept, it was to appear on the Mount of Transfiguration there to discuss with the Lord Jesus Christ himself and with Moses that other great representative of the Old Testament, the decease, the death, which Jesus would accomplish, by which finally the powers of darkness would be broken and the power of death would be vanquished. And here Elijah is swept into glory as a harbinger, as it were, of that triumph. You see, sin and death belong so closely together in Scripture that really when God is dealing with one, he is dealing with the other. When he is talking about one, he is talking about the other. And when at the climax of Elijah's ministry, he is delivered out of death, it is a testimony to the whole nation that God is the Lord and victor over all these powers that Elijah had been confronting. 
and which especially in chapter 19 he had begun to tremble before. So here is a word of hope from the Old Testament scriptures this morning. God has the final word over sin and death and all its kingdoms. God has given notice in Elijah's translation as he did indeed in the translation of Enoch that the day of the kingdom of darkness was going to come and that God's triumph would yet be completed in the coming of Jesus. Now it's obvious that Elijah's impending departure was something of which he and others were aware and they were ready to speak about it and to discuss it. Do you notice in chapter 2 verse 3 for example the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you. And he said, yes, I know it. Hold your peace. And again in verse 5, when they came to Jericho, the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And Elijah himself was aware of it in verse 9, do you notice? When they had crossed, that is the Jordan, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. So that Elijah's departure was something of which he was aware. And more than that, it was something for which he was preparing both himself and other people. And he thereby gives us, apart from the many other lessons to be learned from this chapter a lesson in what we ought to be doing as we are facing the reality of death and the prospect of it. Elijah is not afraid to face it. I know that God was teaching you last Sunday morning about Elijah's astonishing courage. And God gave him this even in the face of his impending departure. And what he does is not to panic about it but to go to various places where he is setting his affairs in order, where he wants to leave behind him the kind of legacy that will be a seal upon his life. Now that's how to face this kind of situation that Elijah was facing. He pays farewell visits. Do you notice the three places? In verse 2 to Bethel, tarry here, he says to Elisha, For the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. In verse 4 to Jericho, he says, Tarry here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And in verse 6 to Jordan, Tarry here, I pray you, the same words to Elisha, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. Now while these places were sites of great significance for Israel's history, And it would be understandable if Elijah was revisiting them in a kind of sentimental journey, I suppose, before his death or departure from this world. Bethel, the place where God met with Jacob. Jericho, the place where God's mighty display of his victory over the enemies of his people was seen. And Jordan, the last barrier that was to be crossed before they went into the land of Canaan, it would have been understandable if he had been visiting these places to recognize the greatness of God in the past and to encourage himself for the future. But I think there was something very much more specific that Elijah was doing. Do you notice that in each of these places Elijah went to before he was translated, there is a group of young men Look at verses 3, 5, and 7, and you'll see them. They went down to Bethel, the end of verse 2, and the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and spoke to him. In verse 5, the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha. And in verse 7, 50 men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they came to the Jordan. Now, who were these men? Well, the sons of the prophets were probably a company of young men. I would imagine that they were part of the fulfillment of that promise that God made to Elijah that he would keep 
7,000 men who had not bowed the knee to Baal. Whether these were men who were there at the time of Carmel or men who were to be raised up in the remainder of Elijah's ministry, we don't know. But there is a very real sense, you see, in which these young men were the fruit of Elijah's ministry. And Elijah, as we have been noticing again and again throughout this study, was not merely living for his own day or his own generation. He was not employing expedients which would do for the present hour. The man was building for the future. He was building for generations to come. Now what was the most important thing that he could possibly do in a situation like this? Well, it was to see that by the grace of God, there would be a generation of young Elijahs who would be being prepared for the challenge of this coming generation. Now you know by his life and by his vision and by his faithfulness, Elijah had seen God produce such a generation of young men as this. And I think he was going to these various places under the hand of God because this is where the future lay. And it was a glorious and wonderful thing. What a legacy. What a legacy to leave. My goodness, would you not be willing to be swept up whether in whirlwind or chariot to glory if you knew that being left in the world was such a great company of young men who were sons of the prophets and who were the fruit most probably of Elijah's ministry. That's a legacy to leave for another generation. May I say to you, there are many of us here this morning involved in the Lord's work in so many different ways. What sort of legacy are you going to leave? You see, Elijah was not just the kind of man who left a stamp on his own time, on his own generation because of his own personality and his remarkable gifts and his unusual being as a person. You can't pass personality on. You can't pass gifts on to other people. But to see God raise up a generation of young men, oh, what a thing that is. I look at some of you who come from other countries here on these Sundays. Many of you are going to a month's vacation now and will be having more leisure to think about things and think about the work of God in your own land. And I think about Africa and I think about Malaysia and I think about Singapore. I think about other areas of the world. And I think about the generations that are yet to come and how we ought to be pleading with God and crying to him to raise up a generation of young men. We were saying a few weeks ago in connection with Elisha's call that that is probably the most significant thing God has been doing in Scotland in the last 25 years. Raising up a company of young men of God to stand in the pulpits of Scotland. And that's where the focus of so much of our praying ought to be. But I want to broaden the spectrum a little bit this morning. We desperately need a generation of young men, and I emphasize men, going out from Scotland to the countries from which some of you come, going out to the ends of the earth. We need a global vision of God's purpose in the world and to cry to him that he would raise up such men. My dear friends, God may not call you to be an Elijah. He probably won't. I don't think we would go get on very well with a whole congregation of Elijahs, do you? 
But I tell you, he calls you to be involved in this business of praying the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into it so that we may begin to see the hand of God coming upon one here and another there, that it may become a glorious and godly compulsion on their spirits, and that we may see here and there and there the sons of the prophets. That's the legacy that Elijah left behind. And in the light of that, there was nothing now to keep him from glory. Now, of course, this is the connecting link with Elisha. If you look at verse 9, When they had crossed the Jordan, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. Because Elisha was to occupy a special position, obviously, in a place of leadership as Elijah left. And Elisha asks him, I pray you let me inherit a double share of your spirit. Now, I don't think Elijah was asking for twice Elisha's spirit and power and grace because he was longing for glory for himself. I think it was rather the reverse, in fact. I think Elisha was conscious that he wasn't half the man Elijah was, and he probably lived in the shadow of this great man for many years and was conscious of his own weakness and inadequacies and inabilities and so on. He wasn't a shadow of this man. But in asking for a double portion, a double share of his spirit, he was simply asking for what the eldest son in a family would have asked for when the inheritance of a father was being divided. The eldest son was given two portions, a double portion. They divided the inheritance into a certain number of portions, one more than the number of the family. And the eldest son got a double portion. And what Elisha was really asking for was that above all, he might have as the one whom God had set his hand upon for leadership, such an access to the authority and power and grace of God as he had seen in Elijah, He saw what we'll discover the sons of the prophets didn't see. He saw that what made Elijah the man he was, was nothing natural in fact. It was that the power of the Spirit of God was upon the man. And this is what he is pleading for. And the really important thing Elisha recognizes is that it's not the personality of Elijah. It's not the gifts of Elijah which he he is to covet, because these are not the things that are crucial. It is the God of Elijah that really matters. Now, this was what the young sons of the prophets didn't grasp. If you look at verse 15 of chapter 2, do you notice that when Elijah has been taken up in the whirlwind into glory, when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho in verse 15 saw him over against them, That is Elisha. They said the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And they said to him, Behold now, there are with your servants fifty strong men. Pray let them go and seek your master. That is Elijah. Because they say it may may be that the spirit of the Lord has caught him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. They said, Get him back, you see. Here they are with God's man Elisha there, but they say, now let's send out a search party into the mountains because he went up in the whirlwind and possibly he's been let down somewhere and what we need is Elijah back again. Now Elisha significantly says, don't send for him. The end of verse 16, you shall not send. And the very significant thing is, their question, these young men, their question was, Where is Elijah? You see, here they were in this situation. So much challenge, so much need, so much sin and anguish in the nation. And they said, where is Elijah? Go and send a search party to get him back. But you see what Elisha's question was. In verse 14, Then he took the mantle of Elijah at the Jordan that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, 
Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And that's the real question, you see. The real question is not, where is Elijah? But where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And immediately Elisha smote the waters with his master's mantle. God said, I'm here. It's all right. I haven't gone away with Elijah. I'm not tied to one man or his gifts or personality or whatever. I am here. And that's the great moment of this transition period. And he is saying to Elisha, Elisha, if you want nothing more than to be God's man, if that's what you want above all other things in the world, then I will be with you as I was with Elijah. And he was. And the young men didn't notice it. The problems of youth are many. The problems of age are many too. I suppose I'm somewhere in between, which is a rather nice position to be in. Anyway, I've always loved being the age I am. And I think it's a great thing to be. But the problems of youth are many. Sometimes young people can be afflicted with a great overconfidence in their own wisdom and ways. If just these old fogies would get out of the way and see some sense and let us do things our way, you know. That's, that's part of the affliction of youth. Or they may suffer from the reverse just as seriously an over-dependence on some older person, sometimes almost a hero worship, you know. Bring him back, they said of Elijah. But you see, Elisha recognized that the vital thing was, is the Lord here? Is God among us? Because what really was significant about Elijah was none of the things that perhaps they had noticed about him, but that God was with him. And that was all that mattered. And that's where our focus is to be, may I say to you. Not on men. Not on personalities or people. But on God. On God. Now, Elisha went back to these three places that Elijah had visited with him. Will you just notice with me? Jordan and Jericho and Bethel. He went in the reverse order, of course, because he was going back towards Samaria again and to Carmel. And he went first to Jordan, where he smote the waters, then to Jericho and then to Bethel. And his concern was to demonstrate there again that God had not changed and that God had not disappeared, that his authority and power may be known in the land through Elisha as it was through Elijah. And that's what these three little incidents with which we conclude this morning demonstrate. At the Jordan, for example, in verses 13 and 14, he saw the power of God doing for him what he had done for Elijah. The waters were parted, and Elisha went over them as Elijah and he had done in the opposite direction. Then at Jericho, when he came to Jericho, do you notice in the paragraph beginning at verse 19, there is a deadly sickness at the heart of the city, found in a spring of water. The men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. And he said, Bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him, and he went to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have made this water wholesome. Henceforth neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. Now I read an interesting article last week which suggests that this very stream in Jericho was at one time befouled by some radioactive material which is a, an interesting thing, whether it is, is the genuine explanation or not, I'm not sure, but that later it was diverted and became pure and is indeed so until this day. But the significance of this, you see, is that here again 
Elisha is demonstrating that God is unchanging in his power to deal with the pollution at the heart of the nation. And this miracle, like so many of the miracles of Jesus, was also a parable. It was a visual aid as well as a miracle and had a message for the people, which was that it is God and his word which cleanses the national life of all that defiles and destroys it. And that was why God had sent Elijah into the national life rotting from the top downwards with Ahab and Jezebel, and God sent Elijah into it to see the national life cleansed. Now here you see they are beginning to wonder what's going to happen when Elijah's gone. Well, it is God and his word because Elisha says, Thus says the Lord. And it may be that the salt is a symbol of that cleansing and that God thrusts that into the heart, the spring of the city. And God means to continue doing this work. Finally at Bethel, there is this remarkable little incident which several of you have asked me about. Somebody said to me in the middle of this week, I hope you're not going to dodge the story about the little boys being eaten up by the bears. Well, I won't, but um, let me just say a word to you about it because this story has a special message, I think, for us. It has become a cause of concern to many people. You know how Elijah went to Bethel and he was going up in the way and these small boys came out of the city, it says in the RSV anyway, and jeered at him. And he turned round and when he saw them he cursed them in the name of the Lord and two she-bears came out of the woods and tore forty-two of them. Let me, as we come to a close this morning, just point out the four questions we need to ask about this final incident in Elisha's transition ministry. The first is, who are these people? They are not little boys, let me first of all emphasize. The Hebrew word means lads, and they were really a gang of youths. They were a mob of hoodlums, in other words, young hoodlums probably, but they had all the threat and violence that you would get from a gang of youths descending on somebody today. I was discovering just last weekend what happened to a member of parliament in London as something like this took place in Chelsea. Now, how many of them were there? Well, what happens when two frightful animals uh, go in amongst a gang like this? I guess the first thing that happens is that they scatter and most of them get away. But 42 of them were attacked by the animals. And that suggests that there was a very large and threatening company of these youngsters coming towards Elisha. Now, what were they doing? Well, they were not mocking Elisha. I don't think Elisha would have cared very much if they had been mocking him. What they were doing was mocking God. Go up, thou bald head, they said. Go up. It was a mockery of how God had taken Elijah to glory, of course. And the term was a term of abuse. And they were mocking not Elisha, but God and through God his servant, exercising the kind of godless anarchy I would judge, that you see a great deal of today. Now, where was this? Well, it was in Bethel, the center of paganism, which used to be the center of state religion. And this mockery of God is a result of that. That adds to the seriousness of it, I would suggest to you. The last question, why? Well, this is really a confrontation, you see, between God and the powers of darkness. It's a challenge to God and to his authority. And one of the fundamental things that needed to be established in Israel was that God is a God who is not mocked. 
That is a principle that runs all the way through the Bible. God is not mocked, be not deceived. And it is something that men may resist and break themselves against, but they will never change that principle that God is not mocked. You notice these boys, young men or whoever they were, were not killed. They were given a fearful warning by God. So here is God establishing his new servant. And we need to have a word of encouragement and a word of warning in our hearts as we go this morning. The word of warning is that we must never have our eyes upon men or their gifts or their personality. That focus will bring us to spiritual ruin. We must never give glory to men. Because God is a jealous God and he will not give his glory to another. We must ask the question, not where is Elijah, but where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? That's the warning. Here's the encouragement. Many of us may feel ourselves inadequate, weak, poor servants of God wherever he has put us down and he has put us all down somewhere. But the encouragement is that God is able to take the most weak and the most fearful of us. And the same God who made Elijah the man he became can make you the vessel of his glory and the instrument of his power. Now let us go out heartened by God with that truth. And let us sing together. As we close our worship, hymn number 89.